Okay, and you want me then on that far left? Yes, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it. Sit in the middle. You're in the middle. I'm in the middle. Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> How's everybody? Everybody good? <laughs> like that? It's my choice. <laughs> have a have a beagle. Ready? Good morning and welcome to the Miller Center. Uh, before we begin today's program, I just wanted to invite all of you, if you haven't already registered for Monday, uh, also in this 11 o'clock hour, so February the 25th, uh, we will have uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman and Ray Takei to explore their new <coughs> book, which is entitled Revolution and Aftermath, Forging a New Strategy Towards Iran. So certainly an important topic, and we hope you'll all come. Uh, the conversation will be moderated by uh, Miller Center Senior Fellow Dale Copeland, who is also a professor in the Department of Politics here at the University. Uh, for those of you who know Mike Nelson, you will realize he is not here, but that Bill Antholis is. Mike is literally and figuratively under the weather uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, so he is unable to join us today. But his book, uh, on the Trump administration's first year with an added segment on the second year of the Trump administration is available for sale uh, out in the ante room, along with Sid Milkus' Rivalry and Reform, which I'll talk about momentarily. Uh, but please feel free to avail yourself of both of those purchases today. And particularly, um, Sid obviously will be here to sign. Mike will be back with us for our Presidential Ideas Festival. May 21st through the 23rd. So if you pick up a copy of his book today and you want him to sign it, I know he'd be happy to do so then. Uh, so let me start, first of all, uh, by introducing my uh, colleagues and friends. It's always a pleasure to share the stage with colleagues and friends, um, starting with Sid Milkus uh, to my far left here. Sid is the White Burkett Miller Professor of Governance and Foreign Affairs. He's also the Cavaliers Distinguished Teaching Professor, so wahoo wah for that, <laughs> uh, and a professor of politics here in the politics department. Uh, Sid's research focuses on the American presidency, political parties and elections, social movements, which is the topic of his current book, Rivalry and Reform, uh, and also he studies American political development. So in addition to teaching uh, hosts of undergraduates and graduate students, he has run the uh, honors program in the politics department. He has chaired the politics department. Uh, he regularly gives public lectures around the country uh, and participates in teacher institutes. We did a, a session for the Aspen Institute on the presidency uh, November a year ago up at uh, their Y River campus, which was amazing. Uh, and Sid is a frequent commentator on media as well. Uh, Sid is a native of Philadelphia, so if you want to talk any <laughs> sports team from Philadelphia, Sid is your man. Uh, uh, and he holds his BA degree from Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania and a PhD in political science from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Sid taught at DePaul th with the W in Indiana uh, and for many years at Brandeis University before we were happily able to snag him uh, for the university here. So in addition to his most recent book on rivalry and reform, which is about presidents and social movements, uh, he is also, along with Mike Nelson, the author of The American Presidency, Origins and Development, development uh, from the founding uh, to the current time, and it is uh, among the best-selling texts 
uh, on the presidency. And that is because Mike and, and Sid are the top presidency scholars in the country, if not certainly the world. So we are so lucky to have him not only at the university, but the Miller Center. I came to a talk here some years ago on a book that I just love that Sid wrote on Theodore Roosevelt and the Progressive Party. Um, so that's also one that you'll want to look at. And then he's also written um, as a co-author, American Government, Balancing Rights and Democracy. Um, now we turn to my other friend and colleague, uh, Bill Antholis, as you know, serves as the director and CEO uh, here at the Miller Center. Uh, before that, uh, Bill, while he had lived in Charlottesville a very long time, was commuting to Brookings as the managing director there for a decade. And he was also a resident senior fellow in governance uh, studies there at Brookings. And his work there focused on uh, the politics and institutions of international diplomacy. Uh, Bill also from 1995 to 99, and this I think in, in many ways for us because we studied the presidency, we have someone who has served in the presidency <laughs> and served in uh, the White House. He was Director of International Economic Affairs uh, on the staff of the National Security Council and National Economic Council, where he served as the Chief of Staff person for the G8 summits in 1997 and 98, and he was also deputy director of the White House climate change policy team. At the State Department, Bill served on the policy planning staff and in the Economic Affairs Bureau. Prior to joining Brookings, he served for five years as director of studies and senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund, and that's a U.S. grant-making and public policy institution that's devoted to strengthening transatlantic cooperation. Uh, which we may ask you about today in light of our current topic. Bill is the author of um, a book called Inside Out India and China, Local Politics Go uh, Global. And with Strobe Talbot, he is the co-author of Fast Forward, Ethics and Politics in the Age of Global <coughs> Warming. Uh, so Bill brings just a wealth of uh, experience and background and knowledge to our topic today. Uh, Bill is a Wahoo. Uh, he earned his uh, BA from the University of Virginia <laughs> in government and foreign affairs, uh, and he has his PhD from Yale uh, in politics. Uh, I should have said, for those of you who don't know me, I am the director of uh, presidential studies here at the Miller Center. I'm Barbara Perry, and again, welcome to all of you. So our topic today is the very timely topic <coughs> of the incumbent president, Donald Trump. We're going to talk about his election. We're going to talk about his first two years uh, in office and perhaps what the future holds. And I'm going to start with some more general and, and historically based questions for Sid because, as, as I say, he studies not only the history of the presidency but American political development, and then turn to Bill with a few more specifics about policy, since that's his area of expertise. But this is going to be very much an, an open and informal conversation, which we will want to draw you into uh, with about 20 minutes left in our session. So about five minutes to noon or so, um, you can begin to raise your hands, and we'll have those with microphones come to you. As always, we ask that, as on Jeopardy, you put your comments in the form of a question uh, <laughs> rather than a lengthy <laughs> statement or lecture. Uh, so with that, let me turn to Sid and ask about uh, this intriguing point that Sid often raises, and I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, and that is whether the election of Donald Trump is a cause mm. of disruption uh, in our politics, a cause of the polarization in our politics, or a symptom of those, or both. Yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to say thank you for that. A wonderful introduction. A little over the top, but, uh, no, I'll, but uh, that's I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. And, and thank you all uh, so much uh, for coming. Uh, it's, it's, it's really an honor uh, to have you here. Um, so I think it's a, it's a bit of both. Um, I, I think uh, in some ways, um, President Trump, his election, his presidency is a symptom of developments that have been going on for about half a century. And uh, maybe it's because I had critical uh, socialization, socialization experience in the 60s, but I think you have to go back to the 60s to really understand uh, some of the, the uh, cultural uh, dynamics of the 2016 uh, election and the Trump uh, presidency. Uh, in, in the 60s, what, what happened was what was a pretty strong New Deal consensus, a consensus for the, the programs for economic security uh, and, and uh, uh, world uh, order, uh, um, that both Democrats and Republicans uh, were committed to. 
Uh, for example, Dwight Eisenhower uh, was the first Republican president elected in the New Deal period, and he subscribed uh, to most of the, the New Deal programs, just trying to change it uh, at the margins. But in the 60s, with the, to, to make a long story short, with the emergence of the Civil Rights Revolution, with the anti-war movement, uh, there emerged major uh, cultural bat battles which raised uh, the, the fundamental question of what it means to be an American. Uh, what is our identity as a country? What is patriotism? Who is patriotic? Who deserves to be an, an American uh, citizen? Who perhaps uh, should not be part of our national uh, community? Now these, that kind of, uh, of conflict has deep roots in, in American history, but after the 60s, I think, and I'd be interested in what uh, Barbara and Bill have to say about this, it became rather a, a routine uh, struggle uh, in, in American politics. And I, I think with, with Donald Trump, and, and you see this especially with the immigration uh, conflict, uh, with the wall, uh, uh, I think it comes to a head. I think he tapped in to some conflicts that were already there. Uh, but uh, in his own, I think, unique and novel ways, uh, he has uh, aggravated uh, or fomented further uh, those conflicts that I, I think we can trace back uh, to, the, to the 60s when liberalism and conservatism became much more polarized over fundamental issues, not only over matters of economic policy, uh, but over fundamental issues of civil rights uh, and, uh, and uh, foreign policy. And Sid, before we d depart from the American political development side of this and the yeah. history, and let, let me take you back even a, a little earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, people will look at Andrew Jackson mm -hmm. uh, as a, a, a precedent for, for Donald Trump. Um, and Trump himself, we know, yeah. has said that he admires Andrew Jackson. He, he, one of the first things he did was put a big oil portrait of Andrew Jackson in the Oval Office. And then you might remember one of the first trips he took out of uh, Washington was a pilgrimage of sorts to the heritage, or hermitage rather, down in, in Nashville, the home of Andrew Jackson. So um, are there precedents, uh, other than the disruption of the 1960s, but going back farther mm -hmm. than that, uh, and you've even mentioned Andrew Johnson as a possibility. Yeah. So can could, so we, could we start with Andrew Jackson and your thoughts yeah. about that. A Andrew Jackson was the first presidency I witnessed in, in person. <laughs> 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 or at least it feels that way, you know? You, you know what I mean? Get your vote for him, that's, uh, that's the key. I, I can't reveal that. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a nonpartisan <laughs> organization. <laughs> so yeah, there are, uh, uh, you're right that um, this, is, this is the president uh, in our history that uh, uh, Donald Trump looks, looks back to him. Besides the thing, things you mentioned, uh, some of you may remember that there was a bit of a contretemps and Andrew Jackson was going to be taken off the $20 bill and Harriet Tubman, the, uh, the, uh, the great uh, abolitionist who was so important to the Underground Railroad, was going to be put on and President uh, Trump stopped that and, 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 and said that uh, Andrew Jackson uh, should remain on the, on the $20 bill. And what they have uh, in, the, in the most simple, simple terms in common is they're both outsiders. Uh, and, and Andrew Jackson was the first president, the seventh president, I think, uh, to be elected from out, outside of what had become kind of a, uh, a, 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 an establishment in the early republic. And an establishment embodied by this very powerful institution, uh, the National Bank, uh, which, uh, which uh, even Jefferson, who, who thought it was a very evil institution, uh, had learned, in a sense, to live with and really didn't dismantle it. Uh, and, and, and Jackson, uh, in a sense, took on uh, the establishment in, in uh, Washington uh, at that time, which was really centered in, in the Congress, and, and took on uh, uh, the, the, uh, what he felt was, was the unsavory relationship uh, between the wealthiest people in America and this national bank, mm -hmm. which had enormous power uh, to influence the, comp the, uh, the country, and really opened up uh, the, the political system in, in a way that I think deserves to be called uh, populist uh, to uh, rather uh, to uh, white males of, 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 modest, of modest means. And this, uh, you know, there were limits to Jacksonian democracy, uh, some, some really uh, significant limits. It did not include women. It did not include African Americans. The Jacksonians were terrible on, on, on abolition. They tried to snuff it out. Uh, but for its time, this was a great opening up of, of the American political system. In fact, before Andrew Jackson, uh, the, uh, the references to American government were 
uh, where it was called the re a republic, the American Republic, beginning with Jackson for the first time in a, in a really uh, comprehensive way. Uh, the American political system is referred to as a democracy. You know, ja so Jacksonian democracy really brought uh, a kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a, a new idea of popular sovereignty mm -hmm. uh, to the American political system. And, and I don't think, uh, we can talk more about this, I don't think uh, Donald Trump represents the kind, same kind of popular force of, of Andrew Jackson. I mean, Andrew Jackson really was from a log cabin. Uh, he, he, his, he didn't have a family that left him what, whatever a million dollars <laughs> would, would have been uh, in that time. He really was, a, 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 a t he really did try to uh, and did in some way successfully take on the economic establishment at the time. He dismantled the bank. Uh, something like the, the, the Trump tax program uh, would have been completely abhorrent to this Jack, these Jacksonians. But I think we're, we're, why the reason he identifies with them is Jackson tried to give voice to those who felt they didn't have a voice in American politics. And Donald Trump saw himself as giving voice to what Nixon first called the silent majority mm -hmm. uh, in, in America. And, and that particularly uh, related uh, to, to uh, people who had come blue-collar workers, uh, people from rural areas, uh, religious uh, evangelical uh, Americans who felt that the, the, the direction of America had moved away from them, that the country had become something they no longer felt an affiliation for. Uh, so in that sense, I, I do think uh, there is some historical connection between uh, Jackson and Donald Trump. Well, Bill, maybe that's a good starting point with, with the election itself in 2016 and the populist strain. And, and mm -hmm. Bill follows as well uh, so carefully European politics, and particularly, I know this will shock you, he follows Greek politics. <laughs> and uh, there, there is a, a, a populist movement uh, that is swirling in, in Europe. And, and in fact, my colleague um, Stephanie George Gakis Abbott and I are writing a chapter for our, um, many of you know about our, our upcoming program on crossroads of the presidency or the presidency at a crossroads and our first volume in that series is going to be about the president and the constitution so Stephanie and I are writing about changes in American politics that the presidents have wrought particularly Donald Trump and Stephanie is also an expert on European populism so she's going to talk about that strain that's going on in Europe as well as in our country but Bill maybe take all over that at that point what what is that populist strain that Sid is tracing all the way back to Andrew Jackson that seems to come to the fore with the Trump nomination? Maybe that's also a good transition into his first year. What, what did he accomplish in the first year period? What did he accomplish in these last two years that relate? What is, what is relating to the base, that populist base that he reached out to? Well, first, thanks for having me on the panel. It's great to be uh, an emergency <laughs> spare backup to Mike <laughs> Nelson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and to get to be with Barbara and Sid, who are, uh, you know, the two real leading scholars here uh, among uh, a great group of scholars. Not being so modest. Um, <laughs> well, not, not only on this panel, but here at the center. Um, it's a great question, and particularly sitting next to Sid, I'm going to now speak as a student of Sid's for the continuity of Trump, um, of populism that, um, I, I don't want to overstate this, but really extends... Um, on the other side of the spectrum, what happened in the Obama election, right? For the first time with Obama, uh, we have someone elected from the Senate since uh, Lyndon Johnson was president. Um, you know, what, what we saw prior to that, Nixon, uh, Ford obviously didn't get elected, um, Carter, Reagan, Clinton, Bush, um, and George, H.W. Bush was the sitting vice president. You had either um, governors or people who had been executives before. And with Obama, you get a senator who is himself in his own way, just having served in the Senate for a very brief period of time, and himself was an outsider, was a celebrity president. Um, and this was relayed to me by a senior Obama staffer after the election of Trump, saying, again, I don't want to overstate this, but they're more similar than many of us feel comfortable talking about because they rode a wave of government, of popular dissatisfaction with government, the loss of faith in government. Um, a big part of that for Obama, remember, he beat Hillary in the primary because he was the anti-war candidate in a way that she couldn't be because she had voted for the Iraq war. 
And a lot of the public faith in government was eroded both because of the Iraq war and because of the financial crisis after that happened in the fall of 2008 when the general election was, was in. But that also helped propel Obama in. And the growing dissatisfaction in the public with both of those things helped get Trump elected, right? He was, of the Republican candidates, the one that was most opposed to a um, vigilant, vigorous foreign policy. Um, he is widely thought of as an isolationist because of his phrase, America first. Um, and on the domestic economy side, um, he was speaking to a lot of people who still felt the aftershocks of the financial crisis a decade later. The Tea Party, remember, came up as a response to Obama's approach to answering the financial crisis, and many of the Tea Party supporters became core to Trump's base. Um, also, having learned from Sid, um, the breakdown in how Congress and the presidency worked together to move legislation shifted a lot of polarized politics to the executive branch. It used to be, as Sid has taught us, that Congress sorted out partisanship. But with Congress gridlocked, the president increasingly started turning to executive action as a way of getting things done. And that president being Obama, uh, a little bit before that Bush. But um, you know, in watching the Obama presidency after the first two years where they did pass a, a great number of things, uh, the response, the, the fiscal response to the financial crisis, the Affordable Care Act, a number of other things that were accomplished legislatively, once they lost, the Congress, once the Democrats long lost the Congress, Obama regularly used executive action to move on a number of different things. And Trump came in having learned that and immediately moving on executive action on a range of things. And as Barbara and Sid know, we were talking to the Trump transition team before election day. And one of the questions they had is, tell us about executive action. How does this work? <laughs> uh, they were planning before they went in. And even those who were jettisoned when Chris Christie was hired as fired as the head of transition, um, they were looking to use executive action to serve their base. I think they knew that passing legislation was going to be hard. Um, so then transitioning to the second part of your question, when they came in, they tried to move uh, against the Affordable Care Act, against Obamacare, and they failed in that. They were able to repeal the mandate, but other than that, they um, were not able to get anything done. Um, and they spent the better part of the first year fighting the Obamacare battle and then finally giving in when uh, John McCain famously voted no. Right. Um, and then they used their last three months to pass, uh, to pass the tax cut, which was a very big bill that included a lot of different things, everything from drilling in the ANWR to um, local tax credits for cities on urban development zones, a, a policy that was ad advocated by and supported by Democrats and the Republicans ended up sweeping it into this omnibus pa uh, tax bill. They focused on one big legislative accomplishment and they got it and they rolled as much stuff into it as they could. And other than that, they mostly moved on a checklist of regulatory and deregulatory actions by executive mm -hmm. action. And then they also, the one other thing that they do claim credit for along with Mitch McConnell, is preserving that scarce resource of floor time in the U.S. Senate. It's the most valuable commodity that Mitch McConnell uh, from your Louisville uh, controls. And, um, and they focused all of it on passing judges, confirming two Supreme Court nominees and 80 federal judges, um, 30 appellate judges and 50 circuit court judges. And to this day, if you ask people in the White House legislative affairs, it's other than the tax bill, the first thing they talk about. And the legacy of that is huge. Um, we think of Warren Harding as one of the five failed presidents in America. If you list, if you ask historians, they rate the five worst presidents. Harding always shows up on the list, served for less than two years, confirmed four Supreme Court justices, um, two of which continued to serve all the way through the New Deal and overturned New Deal legislation. And when uh, FDR was trying to pack the courts, he was essentially trying to get rid of the voting power of Warren Harding's justices. Um, so if you don't think these are important accomplishments, think again, they're critically important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would just add that uh, to Bill's really comprehensive um, su summary there that, uh, or analysis, I think, summary doesn't do it justice, that uh, I think, w I watch, uh, I don't know if you guys, but I have this addiction to watching cable TV every night. <laughs> and, and, I, and I say I didn't have this addiction before Trump. Uh, <laughs> 
but it, it just seems it, so, it just seems so much happens every day that y you know you just have to turn it on and 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 uh, so my wife and I sit there watching it and. I think there's way too much attention, as important as they are, on the Mueller investigation and his tweets, and not nearly enough uh, attention to the major changes that the Trump ad administration has, has brought about through administrative action. Uh, the, the, uh, Bill mentioned that the legislative accomplishments have been, were kind of packed into the tax re reform bill. I, sh I should add to what was packed in there, of course, was the repeal of the individual mandate. Right. Which, 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 is a, which really uh, shakes the foundation, I think, uh, of, the, of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but my research assistants and I have been gathering administrative actions taken by the Trump administration, and they're just staggering. Uh, and he has changed the tra trajectory on virtually, in, in virtually every important policy arena uh, in American politics, both domestically and internationally. Immigration policy, I just wrote a few down. Uh, immigration policy, climate change, law and order, civil rights, trade, uh, and health policy. So even though the Affordable Care Act wasn't repealed, uh, there have been major administrative actions taken that have repurposed that act in, in important ways. Uh, for example, uh, the Medicaid expansion, which is the, the, a core feature of Obamacare, the most redistributive part of it. Uh, it, 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 it. It expands so that it will cover people with, uh, who are uh, below 138% of the poverty level. Uh, but the, uh, slowly but surely, the Trump administration has been getting many states, particularly those who have first uh, refused to expand Medicaid, uh, to uh, attach a, a work requirement, or what they call a community engagement requirement, to get to be a, a beneficiary of this expanded Medicaid uh, program. Uh, and, and this has encouraged some of the 17 states who before this started uh, refused to expand Medicaid to do so. But they've done so in a way by precluding those uh, that the Trump administration does not consider worthy of government aid uh, because uh, they, they are uh, not responsible citizens in, in American politics. Uh, now the, the courts have stepped in and, and slowed a lot of this down. Uh, but whether you like it or dislike it, this is, these are important developments in American politics. And I want to stress what it does, and this is this has really been going on for a long time, and it was important in the Obama administration, uh, and it's even more important in the, in the Trump administration. It, it undermines the rule of law. I mean, they are repurposing the Affordable Care Act without any legislation through administrative action, through administrative fiat, if you will. And, and I think uh, these are the kind of developments uh, of the Trump presidency that we need to pay a lot more attention to. Yeah, and the declaration of a state of emergency on oh, funding yeah. the border wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just takes, oh, I forgot takes about that to another oh, yeah. level. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let's I've got an emergency. I'm thirsty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> let's can, land yeah, on that. Have more water on the table. <laughs> let's land on that a little bit. Um, certainly that was the topic uh, on NPR as I drove in. Uh, this morning, yeah. um, I was listening to that too. Yeah, talk yeah. talk about um, talk about the National Emergencies Act uh, that the Congress passes in 1976 in the wake of Watergate. Mm. Uh, maybe even a little bit about Nixon's impoundment, about the imperial presidency, about the Congress's uh, response to that, with things like the War Powers Act in the early 1970s. How have we ended up here? How have we ended up in this last week or two with this? Uh, announcement of a national emergency that then even the president himself in his Rose Garden press conference said, I didn't need to do this, <laughs> which seems to undermine the emergency <laughs> element of this nationally declared emergency. I, I don't know. Can being in a hurry <laughs> be, a, be a legitimate reason? I guess I go back to John Wooden. I, I, I wanted to do it faster. <laughs> I, I, I have uh, a Part of this, again, I'm good being a student of SIDS, we work together on this. That. Well, <laughs> um, I mean, really, we, uh, we need uh, an announcement. Sit, no, because it's not responsible. <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for all these brilliant comments, Bill Ed Bowles is making. We worked together on this conference that we did um, up at, we did a, a, a scholars seminar with Barbara and other scholars here and other scholars uh, and practitioners at, at uh, Montpelier for for a day, and then we went up to Washington and did a public event at the Hoover Institution. Um, and in that, it, we, we planned for many months in advance not knowing what was gonna happen in the midterms, and we did it one week after the midterms. And as the midterm results rolled in, and you saw this Democratic wave of 40 seats, and it may be 41, depending on what happens in North Carolina um, mm -hmm. going back, um, you saw what we've seen in previous administrations where a president comes in, controls both houses of Congress, 
with their party, has high expectations, um, goes too far, and then gets a big backlash, right? And the backlash was bigger than the previous two times that Republicans um, lost, uh, Bush 43 and Reagan, where there was a big midterm backlash. Um, and so this is the kind of contested fight that's gonna deepen gridlock and only force the president more to, to wring every power of the executive branch that it has including going beyond those powers and challenging the Congress and the courts to stop them. It's sort of a make my day moment. Um, and before now handing it over to Sid, the only thing that I'll say is the biggest challenge that the Trump administration is gonna have in the next two years is that they haven't used that scarce floor time of the on the Senate floor to populate their government with confirmed officials. So you can write every executive order you want, but unless you have confirmed assistant secretaries of state, assistant directors of the EPA, deputy assistant directors. These are actually the people that run the federal government. They are the deans and the department chairs of the federal government, to use the university analogy. So you can write any executive order you want. If you don't have your people in those jobs, you're then leaving it to the career civil servants. And regardless of what you think about them, and I think that they're extraordinarily accomplished professionals, they're gonna keep doing what they've done. And what they've done are the policies that are written into law. So let's use the border thing as an example. The Defense Department is only half staffed. It, if it actually gets to figuring out how to move money from one budget to another and actually driving people down to the border to build a wall, you need experienced people to do it. And frankly, those people will sit on their hands because they don't want to violate the law. They don't want to be legally liable. And they probably don't agree with the policies. And it's not like they're being insubordinate. Mm. They just don't have clear direction on exactly what to do. And I think that that's gonna be as much um, the next uh, two, however long the Trump presidency lasts, <laughs> if, it's, if it's nine months <laughs> or two years that. or six years, that's what we're gonna see in the Trump presidency because it's gonna be harder and harder to confirm officials for this government. Yeah. These are, these are uh, re really good points and he did not learn them from me, I wanna, <laughs> I wanna stress that. But I, I would just uh, add a caveat, uh, and then I wanna do wanna talk about this, this uh, uh, de declaration of emergency yes, and please. the constitutional issues. Um, the uh, bu bureaucracy has been greatly politicized. Uh, that is, the civil service has been weakened. There are many more political appointments. Much more policy responsibility has been centered in the White House office. And again, this didn't begin with Trump. He's accentuated it. <coughs> it just chokes me up. He's accentuated <laughs> it. Um, for example, uh, DACA, which is one of the important immigration initiatives that, that President Obama took, really didn't come out of health and human. I'm sorry, it didn't come out of Homeland Security. It was, it was really uh, formulated and pushed out of the White House um, 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 by uh, people in the Obama, in the West Wing, who were, who were, ver who were uh, designated as policy czars in areas like Im immigration. So Carla, um, Car Carla Munoz, who was an, a close advisor to, to President Obama, really was the one who, who, who was really the vanguard uh, of, the, um, of the DACA initiative. It wasn't like Homeland Security was opposed to it. They just didn't feel like they had a central role in the development of immigration policy, but it didn't mean they didn't feel a lot of pressure to, to carry, out, carry out DACA. Um, uh, uh, now, uh, with respect to this, this new bold, <laughs> this new executive aggrandizement, this declaration of emergency, you know, I, I've been struggling with this part, this question about what happened to us is a good one. Coming out of Watergate, a lot of president, so-called presidency curbing legislation was passed, and, and just to mention one other besides this 1976 Emergency Act is the, the War Powers Resolution. Uh, and, but what these acts did was not so much prohibit the president from taking in, uh, the initiative in military uh, action in, in, in sending troops into, in, into uh, uh, combat uh, or prevent the, a president from declaring emergency, but to give Congress a veto over that action if they had the will to veto that action. So the, for the war power resolution, uh, to really constrain the president, uh, Congress has to take action uh, that uh, within six, uh, 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 within uh, 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 
the, the, the Congress has the right to prohibit that action after 60 days. That's what I was trying to say. Right. Um, uh, but really, the Congress has not real had the w once president commits troops, it's real hard for Congress to, to take strong action uh, to prescribe that action. And, and, and the same thing with the emergency, the, that uh, the presidents uh, are given authority to declare emergencies, which is not in the Constitution last time I read it, mm -hmm. but Congress has the right uh, to, uh, to veto uh, that uh, uh, declaration of emergency through what's called a joint resolution. That means the House has to pass a resolution. I think that's coming up today mm -hmm. in the House. Uh, uh, um, and, and the um, and then the Senate has to pass a resolution. And then, this is the tricky part, the president has to sign, sign, <laughs> sign that. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> now, these, these legislative vetoes, I'm sorry to bore you about all this, but you asked the question. <laughs> you said you wanted to get into the, to the weeds. This, this let kind of legislative veto really became a central part of, of, the, of the modern presidency. It starts with the New Deal and it accelerates uh, af after, uh, uh, after Watergate. It was in some 200 statutes by the, the, the 1980s. And originally, a lot of them had what are called concurrent resolutions, which uh, does not have to be signed by the president. Uh, but but uh, the, the absence of the president's participation in this was declared unconstitutional in 1983 by a, a court case called Chadha. So now the president has to sign uh, uh, these things. And this is going to get tricky when it goes. It's going to go to the court, right? 16 states are already suing. Saying, I thought Congress had the right <laughs> to do this stuff. Um, but it's going to get tricky, I think. And I'd love to hear your view, Bill. And Barbara, you're, you're the con law person, right? <laughs> I didn't teach you anything, you know, uh, about con law. You've forgotten more than I <laughs> know about con law. Yeah. Gets to, gets so so this is going to be tricky when it gets to the court. And I think it will go to the Supreme Court. Uh, because the court does not like to intervene uh, between the President and the Congress when there is some kind of legislative process in place. So if the Congress, and it probably won't uh, pass because of the Senate, if the Congress uh, pa goes through its, 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 the process and passes or doesn't pass uh, these re a resolution against the action, and let's say the Senate does, and that's something interesting, I don't think it will, um, and uh, President Trump vetoes it, um, they'll say, well, this was between the President. They could say this was between the President and Congress. There's a law in place. Uh, to regulate uh, the, the, uh, these, how these decisions are adjudicated. It's not our place to step in. And the recent changes on the court would, uh, would, uh, would seem to me would, ma would make that more likely. Well, you know, here at the Miller Center, we, we land in the present, but we tend to look back and, and inform the present through our understanding of history and even creating history here through our oral history projects and our presidential recording program. Uh, but let's look ahead on this. Um, and not become prognosticators as such, but to say, since we're rooted in history, what precedence do you think Trump is setting uh, across the board? It could be in this realm of uh, invoking this Emergencies Power Act, so it could be on that. But in, in any realm of his presidency, what precedence do you see uh, existing, however long he stays in power, uh, that in perpetuity, perhaps, or at least for the foreseeable future, for good or ill. It's your turn. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, um, look, I think this executive action, I mean, this emergency action um, is a critical precedent, and that's what's making a lot of Senate Republicans nervous. There are 22, 20, 22 Senate Republicans up for re-election in 2020, um, a number of whom might be called moderates. And one thing that Republicans traditionally believe is small government and the power of Congress to um, authorize appropriations, right? That is the core power of Congress as, ar as the Article I branch of the Constitution. Power of the purse. And it's making them super nervous that they would simply turn this over to the President of the United States, mm -hmm. particularly when they had a long discussion and debate and vote and a conference committee, a bipartisan conference committee to authorize this budget, and the President did it regardless. So if this stands as a precedent, that makes a lot of moderate Republicans nervous. Um, so that's precedent one. Precedent two that a lot of people are looking at with a big question, particularly going back to your uh, first set of questions to me, our partners in Europe, is the Trump 
presidency an aberration or is this the new normal mm -hmm. uh, with respect to NATO, with respect to um, how we treat treaties and other agreements like the Iran nuclear agreement, with respect to the United States seeing itself as the leader of the liberal democratic world order and an open and free trading system. If, if this is the new normal, then it makes Europeans think very differently about the global system. And by Europeans, I, I would include um, the Japanese, some big emerging democracies like India and Brazil. Um, they look to the United States for leadership on these issues. And if the United States steps back from that, then they have to think about the world order differently. They have to think about relations with China differently. They have to think about relations with Russia differently. Um, so th those are the big precedents that I'm paying attention to is, uh, you know, will the next president step in and revert back to a system where democracy was a central, and I should say democratic capitalism was a central defining feature of our foreign policy. Again, going back um, to the populist moment, there is not a lot of public trust in international institutions, in international engagement. You know, Trump is, I think, acting in a way that's similar to Nixon after Vietnam, who was more of a realist, because he saw something in the American people fearful of global engagement after a disastrous war in Vietnam. Trump, like Obama, saw the engagement in Iraq as open-ended and expensive and was feeling a popular surge to pull back. So as important on the precedent side is not just how long Trump serves, but if he's replaced by a Democrat, is it a pro-internationalist Democrat or a more isolationist uh, mm -hmm. Democrat? You know, the socialist wing of the Democratic Party, and we can call them socialists now because they call themselves socialists, <laughs> um, has been very skeptical of international engagement. I left the White House in 1999 in the run-up to the Seattle WTO meeting. You remember we had um, tear gas and riots on the streets of Seattle at a meeting of the WTO that was left protest against the international and the Clinton administration was trying very hard to keep globalization safe for the Democratic Party. And uh, the uprising on the left was their main set of concerns, not the uprising on the right. So th that's an important precedent to keep an eye on. Are we going to go back to <laughs> global engagement, or are we going to move toward a more isolationist, protectionist yeah. uh, stance in foreign yeah. policy? Yeah. Um, I, I, um, these are, these are uh, great points. I want to come back to this last point in just a second. Mm -hmm. But uh, to the point of, of precedent, which I do think is this is really important. So. The, the, the uses of, uh, of this um, 1976 statute by presidents have mostly uh, been connected to some kind of serious um, um, international um, um, crisis. I think Bush 41 used it with, with the Iraq war. Bush 43 used it after 9-1-1. Uh, it, it's never uh, been used um, um, with such uh, a limit, limited evidence of a real of a real crisis, with, with, with what really will look, looks to a lot of Americans like a fabricated uh, uh, crisis. More broadly, if you go back in our history, when you think of major presidential power plays, uh, Truman's uh, attempt to seize the steel mills uh, during the Korean War, uh, Richard Nixon's attempt to declare an unlimited power of executive privilege during the Watergate incident, they were stopped uh, partly by the courts, but also by by Congress where institutional loyalties were, were str stronger than partisan loyalties during those moments of crisis. And what I've seen happen, and Bill mentioned gridlock and how um, uh, uh, the president's fellow partisans in Congress now look to, to the president in a sense, if any of you study Alexander the Great, to cut the Gordian knot, to break through this, this, um, uh, th this uh, gridlock this partisan gridlock, and carry out uh, party programs unilaterally. Uh, with that development, we saw it uh, quite a bit in Ob the Obama presidency. We see it uh, uh, even, uh, even more dramatically, I think, uh, in uh, the, the Trump presidency. Partisan loyalties are, are now, I think, stronger than institutional loyalties. And, one, and I think Bill said that this will be a moment of truth for Republicans in the Senate, many of whom feel that this would set a precedent that Democrats would use to declare a health care crisis or a climate change uh, crisis. Uh, this will be a real test of how strong what, what we call the Madisonian system is, the system of, of checks and balances. Will Republicans I I in the Senate uh, stand up for constitutional issues and, and, and resist 
uh, the, the presidency. Uh, and and I, I, I think this is probably uh, the most serious constitutional crisis we've had uh, since Watergate. Uh, and if the, the, uh, the trajectory is different, if partisanship wins out over constitutional principles, I think that is really dangerous. If you look at the weakening of do democracy in a comparative perspective across countries, it's not the rewriting of laws that causes it. That's not what the research tells us. Forgive me for mentioning research here <laughs> in a post-truth world. Post world. Uh, what causes it is uh, delegation of power uh, to the executive, executive aggrandizement. That erodes what a lot of my colleagues now call the guardrails of, of, a, of, a, of a liberal or constitutional democracy. So this is a really dangerous time. And just one word on this, uh, on whether uh, the Republican Party is going to go in a free trade direction or continue on this protectionist direction. And this relates to my point about executive centered partisanship that the president, uh, the party takes its, its, its cues from the presidency. One of the things I found really interesting in studying the, the trajectory of, is that my music? <laughs> I'm not going to sing, sorry. <laughs> I have great talent, I'm not going to do karaoke. Um, what, one of the things I found interesting is how the views of Republican uh, loyalists and independent-leaning Republicans have changed during the Trump presidency in, in matters of trade and the wall. That, that, that there's been a dramatic shift towards the Trump position on, on both trade uh, and immigration policy uh, from, uh, among Republican <coughs> loyalists uh, and, and independent-leaning Republicans. And it started during the campaign. If you look at Pew, surveys through the campaign, you see a dramatic shift in uh, 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 Republican identifiers uh, saying that they don't think free trade is a good idea, a great increase in that. So, you know, I'm trying to struggle, I, I'm supposed to write a piece now on Trump and the Republican Party. Mm. And one of my conclusions, I'll have to work back through the evidence, is that the Republican Party has become the Trump, yeah. the, the Trump Party. It's a smaller, harder it's, core of yeah, a party. Yeah. It's gone from depending on how people identify or self-identify as Republicans, from roughly 31 to 34 percent of the public to about 27 percent. And 80 to, and um, Sid will cor correct me on the numbers, but I think it's gone from about um, 80 percent of Republicans supporting the president to 85 to 87 percent of Republicans supporting. So it's smaller but more intensely pro-Trump. Yeah, and they vote. They turn out. And they vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're, they're intense. It's, it's atavistic. Their relationship with Trump is, is, is primordial. It's impossible to break. Can we talk about the, uh, the administration itself? Mm -hmm. uh, I think some might say it appears from the outside to be dysfunctional at times, and yet you've just named a whole host of policies uh, that have been successfully implemented, passed through Congress. Uh, you've talked about this president, in essence, creating this Republican Party in his own image and likeness. Um, but to some, it seems quite chaotic and, and even dysfunctional. So how can you square, <laughs> how can you square those? Uh, mm -hmm. If it's dysfunctional, how is it functioning? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Reminds me of my family, actually. <laughs> we're, we're functioning, but man, are we dysfunctional. <laughs> the milk guy. More on that later. <laughs> not, not more on that later. But <laughs> <laughs> you guys put me on the couch. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I wish Mike was here because uh, I was reading Mike's uh, uh, book on um, the second. Uh, he, he's, uh, he put out a new edition of his book on Trump, right? He put right, so he, he he's wrote, got one on the first. He wrote for the University Press of Virginia last year a book on the first year because that had been the most recent initiative of the Miller Center was yeah. to study this, whichever president would be elected in 2016, to study his or her first year and compare and contrast it to previous presidents. So Mike spun off of that an entire short book on the Trump first year and then most recently added a chapter on the second year. So that's yeah. the one that is available yeah. to you along with yeah. SIDS today. So what Mike argues in that is during Trump's first year, the, the administration was dysfunctional. Uh, because there was an effort to reach out beyond Trump loyalists and have people uh, like McMaster uh, and, 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 and um, uh, John, almost John Kelly as, as chief of staff, who are not within the Trump family. Uh, you were, speaking of family. Speaking of family, some of whom are yeah, certainly in there. And, and that led to, to quite, uh, you know, the, 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 the scenes that are depicted most vividly by Woodward, in Woodward's book. 
Um, but in the second year, the, uh, the administration, a lot of those people have left or have been uh, dismissed, and they've been replaced by more loyal people, more people who agree with Trump's policy. So you now have Pompeo, uh, and you have um, John Bolton in, in, in place. And who's this? Do we, have, do we have a chief of staff now? We have an acting? We have an acting uh, chief Mike of staff. Mulvaney, who's doing about 15 jobs. Because <laughs> 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 it's, it's getting hard to, for Trump to like, you know, call it enough. To, uh, <laughs> and, and, more, and more power shifted to, to Jared Kushner. You know, speaking of uh, uh, family. So it's been, according to Mike, and I, I think this is true, uh, it's been less dysfunctional uh, the second year, that it has become more decidedly a Trump administration. Uh, and, and many uh, of, the, of, the, of these policies, which, as Bill pointed out before, were being resisted uh, previously. Like uh, for a long time, Trump was talked out of withdrawing from the Iranian nuclear deal. Uh, but once you get people like Pompeo, you know, uh, and Bolton in there, then, then there's, uh, there's nobody speaking truth to power uh, a, a any longer. So uh, it's a leaner, meaner administration now. It's, it, and that's very dangerous because that sets up a kind of palace guard men mentality. You, one of the things that I think you need in a presidency and a constitutional democracy is somebody who will speak truth to the power. Uh, somebody who will say no to the president. This is the wrong thing to do. And all presidents, not many presidents like to hear that. Obama didn't like hearing it, but they know they have to hear it. And uh, Trump seems very comfortable not hearing <laughs> that this is the, not hearing uh, that. Don't just follow your instincts here. Think. Let's let's take a deep breath before we take this. To that point, we hear that over and over in our the, the oral histories we have released. You know, we we do our oral histories here under a veil of confidentiality, so that we we will interview. We've interviewed, for example, now a hundred uh, Bush forty three top senior officials from the Bush <coughs> administration. And we hope to release that uh, in this coming November. Um, that is those uh, that have been cleared by the interviewees. Uh, but until that is the case, we, we don't talk about them. But going back to the previous ones, the Miller Center's done the oral histories of every president, starting with Jimmy Carter. My colleague Bob Strong is here from Washington and Lee, who has participated in these throughout the years. Uh, Sid, has, Sid has, Bill has been going with us now and, and setting up for us with President Clinton. We've been interviewing him out at the Clinton Library uh, twice now before Christmas, and we hope to go back in April and do a couple of more interviews with him. Um, but, but certainly what, what these senior officials tell us through the years in these clear transcripts is that even if you intend to go to speak truth to power to the president, once you're in the Oval Office, it's much harder to do. So even if you have that intention, yeah. it's difficult. And then when you have perhaps a president like the current incumbent who is rather disruptive in his personality and his approach, and we know that from what we've heard and read that he, he does have an anger, as many presidents have had, it probably gets even harder. What I find ironic is that if, if that is, I think, the case that Mike is making, that the administration seemed more dysfunctional, was indeed more dysfunctional and chaotic in that first year, but it didn't really matter, did it, to the, to the base of the president, to the core yeah. of the president's supporters, or maybe to all those who voted for him, but certainly to the base, because he said, I will be disruptive. Vote yeah. for me. I will be disruptive. I will, tr I will take the checkerboard in Washington, and I will throw the pieces up in the air. Yeah. Whichever metaphor you want to yeah. use, I'll break the china, I'll throw the chess pieces to the ground. I'm not a politician. And to the populist position of anti-elitism, anti-politician, but of course that goes, that's a strain in our American political culture that goes back to our founding and back to our revolution. Fear of power, uh, suspicion of power, suspicion of far away power, suspicion of politicians. Um, it, it didn't even matter to the base because that is what the candidate Trump said, said that he would do. Yeah, well, please. If, yeah, if I can just jump in on that. It, it, leads me to two very connected things. One is um, he, he has run a true hub and spoke style of management where he is dealing directly with each of these cabinet secretaries and now for half the cabinet acting secretaries, right? He's not, um, he's not confirming people. So at the defense department, he's got an acting person and you know, in one place or another, He's having a hard time filling the government and he's working directly with these people and not running a process where they all communicate and talk to one another. 
And that is the one piece of dysfunction. I haven't read Mike's follow-up book, but in my own conversation with um, senior Trump officials and other people that watch this, um, they're still not running the normal planning meetings that when you work in the White House, this is most of what you spend your time doing. You're not actually deciding policy. You're convening a meeting where you're trying to get people to agree on a government-wide policy. And this administration just mm -hmm. doesn't do that. And then the fights within the administration are the left hand doing one thing and the right hand doing something else. We, um, you know, we're joking about having a discussion or a debate with a senior Trump official on trade policy. And I was raising the idea of the president's uh, economic advisor, Larry Kudlow. And they said, well, the debate should be between Larry Kudlow and um, Robert Lighthouser, who runs trade policy. Have the debate from within the administration as your public debate. You know, <laughs> that's literally what happens in the administration, except it doesn't happen around a table. It happens in public. Um, so that's a very chaotic thing to manage in an administration. And then the second thing that's related to that, as Sid was saying about someone like Mom, Mike Pompeo, what you get as a government is how effective any individual in a cabinet agency is in doing their own thing. So Mike Pompeo is Trumpish, um, but he has tried more than Rex Tillerson, who was a true let's break the China. He's tried to work with the State Department bureaucracy a bit. It's still tense there, mm. but he's been much more welcoming of career State Department people. Uh, a, a classic example of that is Elliot Abrams. Um, Tillerson was so disruptive and he wanted Elliot Abrams to come in as his deputy and the White House said no. Pompeo is clearly steering his own course and he convinced the administration to let Elliot Abrams be a special coordinator on Venezuela. That's a sign of a guy who has, uh, Pompeo, who has a sense of bureaucratic politics and is working his cabinet agency. There are other cabinet secretaries that just don't have that finesse. Mm -hmm. And they're really struggling to manage their own agencies. Um, sometimes that's in the public. We saw an EPA and Interior. We've already cycled through, and we don't have replacements in those two agencies now. In other agencies, you essentially have walking dead secretaries. <laughs> they have no support from the White House. There's no cleared policy. There's no legislative legislation behind them. They're sitting in their agency without any staff underneath them that has been confirmed, so nothing's happening. So there is still, in my view, quite a lot of dysfunction yeah. in the Trump administration yeah. because you don't have these lower orders and there's no clear guidance from across the top. And so essentially, they're just not doing anything. That may be a good thing, depending on how you view these agencies, but, but that is the reality in a number of yeah. agencies. The Energy Department is probably the foremost of that, which yeah. is Rick Perry is without guidance. He's running an agency that's largely about either protecting nuclear material or cleaning up uh, uh, nuclear, you know, waste dump. nuclear waste dumps. <laughs> and he's no, getting no central direction from the administration and uncertain funding from Congress, so nothing's happening there. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how this disruption of protocol um, plays out mm -hmm. um, politically. Uh, because Trump, you know, this battle over the wall, which everybody thinks, you know, Trump has just gone off the, the rails. Uh, and this is an example of his, his uh, that he's uh, in, uh, not qualified to be president. Um, there, I don't think he's gone off the rails. I think he, there's a, gr a great deal of He's, he's, he ha, he's a very, there's a great deal of political savvy in Trump's calculations, and he knows American politics has become, with this polarization, a more base-oriented politics. We used to talk about the median voter in American politics, reaching to the center. Hardly anybody has, has done that in the last three decades or, or, or so, even more moderate presidents. And, and one of the um, reasons for the decline in trust in government that Bill talked about, which is such an important part of Trump, Trump's populism, uh, is that pre it was thought that presidents didn't keep their promises. Uh, and Trump, you know, this wall was, and this was a leading promise. This was the, this was the major event at these mass, and still is. Mm -hmm. Build the wall, build the wall. It's, ta it's, 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 uh, it, it's take on, taken on a symbolic significance that is much greater uh, than actually putting up a barrier on the southern border. And symbolism is really important uh, in, in American in American 
Uh, so interestingly, politics. along that note, Sid, so and, and, say, and, 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 and messaging, yeah. is that the message has changed. You might notice at the rallies from build the wall to finish the finish wall. The wall yeah. uh, and so there have been stories yeah. written about that. Yeah. Before we get to... Uh, I just to wanted to say that oh, sure. Trump and typical Trumpism, he's <laughs> he said that he's, uh, he's kept more promises than he made. <laughs> <laughs> seems to be a mathematical impossibility. Well, that's an achievement, right? There it is. Right. That, that's one you can't attribute to Yogi Berra. Like, you want to give Yogi credit for that, but that's a that Trumpism. Does, that does like that. I, I should add also, there was a lot of disruption in protocols in the Jacksonian presidency. Cap there you go. Constant another another yeah. parallel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we get to your questions, uh, Bill, we, it, it's related to this um, turnover and dysfunction uh, in the uh, Trump presidency in the first two years. Um, the Miller Center, as you probably know, has practitioner fellows. So we have invited in from, because of our nonpartisan status, we invite people from all parties, from all presidencies, uh, who wish to come here to serve as practitioner fellows, along with our faculty fellows and, and chaired professors, um, to offer their practical experience. Uh, and, and frankly, also to reach out to their colleagues and, and bring them in for special programs such as we have here at Forums, but also for our Presidential Ideas Festival, just as an example. Um, and so we have had the interesting experience of spending six months with a, a Trump advisor and indeed his legislative director, Mark Short, who just last week announced that he was going to be leaving his uh, practitioner fellowship here and to go be the chief of staff for Mike Pence, for whom he had worked previously. So we've had this interesting experience of being able to draw on his experiences uh, to learn about from the inside, the, the Trump administration, which we believe will be tremendously important for history. When people look back at this period and say, what, what was this all about? Uh, who were the people who eventually supported Trump? Who were the people who went to work for him? Why did they leave? Why did on occasion they go back? So, Bill, I wanted to give you the opportunity to chat a little bit about that. Well, it was, uh, it was certainly... Uh, uh, a personnel move that got a lot of attention, uh, which we, which frankly we didn't anticipate getting a bit as of an much. <laughs> yeah, um, I, we didn't anticipate getting as much perhaps attention because this has been part of what we've done uh, at least for the last couple of years. But going back before that, we have a James Schlesinger chair, uh, the James Schlesinger himself, who was served as Secretary of Energy and before that as Secretary of Defense, set up at the center to bring in senior former practitioners on a regular basis. Um, from both parties, and so we've been blessed to, to have some, some really great ones. And uh, Mark was a terrific colleague here. He came to, uh, came to or called in to regularly for staff and faculty meetings, as, as both Barbara and Sid know. Um, he helped us think about how to do a Trump oral history. On the one hand, uh, these various officials have not had a hard time talking to reporters off the record. Um, on the other hand, we've typically done these working closely with with um, presidential foundations and libraries, and we thought forward, the Trump Foundation is currently under indictment, if I remember, or at least <laughs> investigation in New York. And we thought we really need to get started thinking about this in a thoughtful way. And Mark was really helpful in understanding um, the different power centers within the administration, as Sid referred to. Um, you know, there's a Kushner Center, there, uh, there has been the more traditional Republican one, which was Reince Priebus handing it over. Um, to Kelly, and then there was the Steve Bannon faction in the White House. So understanding how those things actually worked within the White House, how the president himself made decisions, um, why, for instance, they have confirmed judges as opposed to moving on legislation. We learned a lot of that from Mark, um, which was extremely valuable. Like our other practitioner fellows, Mark um, public participated in a couple public events that we had, which is typically we usually ask fellows to our, participate in two events a year. Mark did one with Larry Sabato that a number of you probably attended and then was part of the planning for and the participation in the conference at Montpelier and Hoover. Um, and in addition to that, Mark met regularly with students. He appeared in my class on the presidency and Sid's class. He uh, participated in a Darden class and a Batten School class. I asked my own students after the controversy a few weeks after when they all came in, how many of them would object to meeting with Mark and not a single hand went up? How many would like to meet with Mark? Every single hand went up. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the class. It was 18 first year students, 13 women. Um, I asked people at the beginning to fill out um, uh, a form 
talking about a whole bunch of things like what's your favorite sport and what's your favorite musician and who's your um, political hero. And seven of the people listed Michelle Obama as their political hero. So I don't want to speak to what their partisan <laughs> politics are, but this was an intellectually diverse group of students. Their hour and a half with Mark was really terrific. They asked him hard questions. They had him on his heels mm -hmm. a couple times. Um, <laughs> he gave them very frank answers, including where he agreed and disagreed with the president. Um, he, he told them about what it was like in, to work in the White House. And as he shared with, with Barbara and me, and perhaps Sid, um, how he went from being an anti-Trump uh, Republican to ending up joining. He was asked by Mike Pence uh, to work on the campaign, and he went to a rally in the Midwest, and when he saw the size of the crowds there, he realized that something was going on, and that made him think differently as a free trade Republican, how and why protectionism was something that was an emerging part of the Republican agenda. I don't know, Sid, any thoughts that uh, you have from I, your I, own? I want to get us to, uh, get to the audience's questions, but I would just say the experience with my class, my presidency class was very much like the one you described. My, my students, most of whom are, are, are liberal, I think, but they have a love-hate relationship with the Trump administration. Many of them disagree with what the president's doing, but they, they, they are absolute, they want, they're hungry to learn about it. Uh, they, they think it's almost like a car accident, you know, <laughs> <laughs> a car wreck. They can't avert their eyes from it. And, and they've, they really, uh, I made the, the session with, with Mark voluntary and almost all of them came and they, they had him back on his heels <laughs> a, a, a couple times, but he didn't get defensive and, and, and almost all of them thanked me uh, for having him. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I study the presidency and Trump is president and it's really was, is valuable having somebody in the building who could tell me really important things about the dynamics of that presidency. And one of the things he told me that I found most interesting, it may be trivial in the big scheme of things, was with this tweeting, you know, and a lot of members of Congress would say, I wish he wouldn't tweet so much, you know. He's, he's doing good stuff, but he shouldn't tweet so much. That's the, so Mark told us, I think you were in the session, uh, that a lot of members of Congress would come to Mark, who was the, congr the congressional liaison from the White House, and ask, give him things they wanted the president to tweet. <laughs> 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 and that's a little nugget that's really helpful in understanding <laughs> the dynamic that's of the great, president and Congress. Story. We've yeah. all experienced that here with Jim Ryan. As his social media is following, we're like, how can we get in the Jim Ryan <laughs> tweets, right? Yeah, can Jim, can Jim, Pass can them you, along. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, uh, Bunny is going to be womaning our microphone uh, and again form of a question and remember our uh, our commitment to civil discourse uh, my question is what's up with mitch mcconnell <laughs> he he seems to have abandoned the uh, any kind of institutional loyalty uh, as opposed to what he was doing most under the prior administration where uh, he held on to his priorities. And, and one most recent uh, example is when he uh, they, um, passed a budget, um, the, the president turned it down, and then he sat on his hands and said, I'm not going to pass a budget that the president won't approve. So again, caving in. I mean, is it only because he's afraid of Trump uh, in, in his uh, Senate in his Senate seat race, or is there something I'm missing? Yeah. Do you want to, as a Louisville, as a Louisville Having just come from native. the McConnell Center, I, where I spoke for President's Day uh, this past Monday, and a, a Louisville native, um, I think your last point is, is well taken. Uh, Mitch is up for re-election in 2020, and uh, the polls show him running behind the president in approval ratings in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And so I think uh, not only that, but even going back to 2008 after he voted for the first TARP, um, it, the election was, his re-election race was closer. His next re-election race was closer than he anticipated. He then was Tea Party uh, in his most recent uh, primary. So, uh, that would be four years ago now. Um, and that was really before Trump was a factor. There's a Tea Party governor of Kentucky called Matt Bevan. Um, Kentucky is just very strongly pro-Trump right now. So I think he, he, has, he wants to be reelected, as most politicians do. Uh, his greatest ambition uh, always was to be uh, the Senate Majority Leader. He went to the University of Louisville as an undergraduate, and he interned for John Sherman Cooper, 
uh, who was a moderate Republican from Kentucky and a great statesman, uh, and a good friend of Jack Kennedy's in the days when bipartisanship was allowed and, and reigned to some extent. Um, so he's, he's always been um, someone who, who revered the Senate, and again, his greatest uh, aspiration was not to be President of the United States, as most of the other 99 members of the Senate want to do, <laughs> but rather to be the majority leader, and I, I know he would like to hold on to that. So I think a lot of it is driven, as it is for all of these politicians, uh, by their abilities to, to be reelected. So I, I think your last point is, is probably the one to, to land on. Yeah, I, I would just add quickly <laughs> that uh, I think it's really been fascinating to watch uh, Trump's uh, intervention in primaries mm -hmm. and, and the, really the important effect he's had on him. I think that's unprecedented. And presidents used to be pretty reluctant to intervene. FDR in tried, FDR, they, we know. They, they called it the pur purge. They called it the purge campaign right, after what Stalin. Yeah, was it? you know, and that that was a that was a heavy. But he wasn't particularly yeah. successful at it. No, no. But Trump has really. This is one of the ways he's made the Republican Party a Trump party, and the the people being who have been willing to speak up for him, like Flake, are people who have decided they're not running. And we should also election. remember that that the Senator McConnell's wife, Elaine Chao, is in the cabinet. She is uh, the uh, Secretary of Transportation. She yeah. just very generously offered us eight hours uh, of oral history for her the eight years she spent uh, as the uh, Department of Labor Secretary in the Bush 43. Uh, presidency, yeah. so that that has to yeah. be, I'm sure, another factor uh, that he's I, I would just say uh, institutionally uh, that he's made a, made a Faustian bargain with Trump that he's always wanted to influence the court. This has been a really important uh, objective of his for a long time, and he felt if he played ball with Trump, he'd be able to have a. So major if you if you on read the, the um, New York Times cover story that was, that was about him, story, actually, really yeah. focused on that, that yeah. that was another of his goals, and uh, he's he's reached it to be sure. We have a. a Student, I think. Uh, yes, I'm back. a grad student here at UVA. Thank you so much. I'm also from New Albany, Indiana, so I know. My dad Kentucky was born in Jeffersonville. All right. You're a yes. Hoosier. You're a Hoosier as well. So you know what DePaul is. I do, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question. It's a little bit different than what we've been talking about, but. Um, um, said your comment on Madison made me think about it. Um, when I think about identity right now, the identity of voters and people kind of finding their groups, I think back to Madison's idea that you need to have a ton of diverse groups. You really don't want any kind of majority. Yeah. And I, I feel like that sentiment has been lost a bit um, in probably the, I don't know, in time. Um, and it's like you need to kind of find a large group to be a part of. And if you can't agree with that, then mm -hmm. you don't belong. And so I was just curious for some comments on how we can maybe bring those kind of principles um, to bear in the 21st century of having a very large, diverse nation. And that's really what keeps our government accountable. Thanks. Mm -hmm. okay, great question. Uh, great, great, uh, great question. You, you want to? Uh, yeah, I have, I have a, uh, an answer that may come across as sounding funny, which is, um, <laughs> And I truly did learn this from Sid. <laughs> pre presidents who think creatively about assembling political coalitions become very dangerous both within their party and to the other party. And I learned that from Sid as we prepared to go down to meet with President Clinton, who I served and didn't think twice about it. President Clinton got impeached, and I'm not sure that Sid argued this in the article. We were preparing for it, and Sid wrote an article about the Clinton presidency. And he said Clinton was so threatening to Republicans and it probably motivated even their efforts to impeach him because he scrambled the deck. He was able to attract people back to the Democratic Party that the Democratic Party had lost and that was threatening. He assembled a really diverse coalition of Democrats that included the so-called Reagan Democrats, working class, blue collar whites, um, along with uh, sort of ethnic minorities and um, university professors, urban cosmopolitans. Clinton just had a unique way of building the coalition. And that was really threatening to Republicans. And there's an argument that I think one could way overstate because Trump is offensive to a lot of people across the political spectrum, 60% uh, unpopularity ratings for a number of different reasons. But I think there's a part of Trump that's threatening to Democrats because he did some of that. He attracted people back to the Republican coalition that Democrats felt that they owned, uh, working class whites. Um, and that was, you know, eight years of Clinton and eight years of Obama where they sort of eventually moved back to the Democratic Party. But particularly the protectionist wing of the Democratic Party, the, the industrial state Midwest whites, 
he assembled a more diverse coalition than traditionally had been thought of as Republican. It didn't have ethnic minorities, it didn't have as many women in the coalition, but it was an eclectic coalition of working class whites, predominantly, you know, heavily male. Um, yet it was diverse, and that's threatening to people as much as it empowers a president. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, just add that Madison was a lot more wary of partisanship when he was working on the Constitution than when he was in, than when he was in the, in the <laughs> Jefferson administration. <laughs> and, and he wrote some really scathing assaults on Hamilton's uh, program, particularly the, the, na the National uh, Bank. And he found that actually American government didn't work uh, very effectively. And you couldn't really pose a loyal opposition to what you deemed uh, a dangerous, uh, a, a da a dangerous uh, um, a opponent if you didn't have a, p a political party that could put together a majority uh, coalition. Uh, and and so we've had, um, throughout our history, we've had major periods of, of polarization, starting with the revolution of 1800, as, as Jefferson called. That was really, <laughs> and Bill, Bill knows this, actually knows this period better than I, that was really bitter partisanship. Jefferson said people would walk across the street and avert their eyes rather than walk past a political opponent. Uh, whom, they, whom, whom they might <laughs> encounter in, 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 ta in, in, in taking a walk around uh, the capital. Uh, but, but in the past, all the, most of these big battles have been resolved peaceful, peacefully. The one huge example, uh, a huge exception, is the Civil War. And one thing that scares me, and this, this could be a deep discussion, but is a lot of people now, uh, when they talk about our partisanship, which is really rooted in some powerful sectional, sectional and cultural differences. And this came out of the 60s with, with the South abandoning uh, the, the Democratic Party. They compare this period to the Civil War. And they say, well, you know, <laughs> we had a major confrontation in the Civil War. We'll get through this thing. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of nerve wracking. So you wonder, is it possible for someone to put together a coalition as, as Bill was describing? That would be a majority coalition like the New Deal was from the 1930s un until the late 1960s. And, and I'll, I'll just say, we can talk about this more if you guys want to. I think the Democrats have a good opportunity to do this, to build a center, uh, to build out from the center uh, and, and put together a, a, a liberal social democratic party. Notice I say social democratic party, not democratic social party. Uh, they have the opportunity to do that. I think they could, they, we could see a major realignment uh, in, in American politics following from the 2020 election, but there's real doubts about whether they're going to take that course. We had a couple questions here. Oh, Matt, I see, and then we'll come up here. Bunny, if you don't mind, we've got, we've got a couple here. Yes, Matt. Great, thanks okay. so much. My, my question is about the uh, Trump administration's use or, or non-use of uh, personal diplomacy with world leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. to accomplish their international objectives. I'm thinking that in recent decades, um, presidents have put a significant emphasis on personal diplomacy um, with world leaders, thinking of Reagan and Thatcher, or Clinton and Blair, or Bush and Tony Blair, or uh, George H.W. Bush and Helmut Kohl, and so on. And I'm wondering how much has President Trump done that or not done that, and what impact has that mm -hmm. had on his Go foreign ahead. policy? Yeah. Definitely has done it. This is the, the ethos of the Trump foreign policy that I alone can do things, right? Um, and cutting through the bureaucratic challenges, not just within our government, but what NATO alliance or other alliances around the world allow you to do. And I'll say it's not unique to the United States, right? We're seeing this not just in authoritarian countries, but even a country like India that elected Narendra Modi now uh, six years ago, five years ago. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, there is a growing around the world complexity of government that populists rise up against. And what that empowers them to do internationally is do their own deals. And the biggest challenge with that is that um, those deals don't end up sustaining past their time. If they pass an agreement on a one-to-one -one basis without the Congress coming in behind it, without allies coming in, the next leader can come in and change it. They may not care about that because, you know, when they're gone, they're gone and they don't worry about the legacy. Um, but it, it leads to a sort of chaotic um, catch as catch can foreign policy. And uh, that poses challenges. And so what they get are even someone like John Bolton 
privately right now, or not so privately, saying to the president or saying to others around the president, he could do a really bad deal with Kim on North Korea, and that would be bad for us. Um, and evidently, Pompeo is starting to feel that way as well. Um, not to mention the intelligence agencies on all of these issues, right, where you need these big, deep bureaucratic systems working with allies and partners to make the intelligence process work. And if the president throws it out in advance of a meeting, um, you, you get institutional antipathy toward the president. And you don't want that in a system. Uh, the president doesn't want that in the system. So it's, I, I think it's a real, it's a reality of the, of the Trump presidency with real dysfunction coming that he himself may start to experience. Yes, sir. If both the House and the Senate could muster veto-proof majorities against the wall, would that not be enough to kill it without going to the courts? Yes, that would kill it. <laughs> and, and, and that to me is, the, is what I want. That's my, that's my best, you know, that's the best outcome we could have. Because I, I really think the greatest constitutional crisis we have now is Congress not living up to its constitutional responsibilities. My only question to that, Sid, as I sit around and talk about this with my <laughs> kids who ask the same question as they're going through their yeah. high school AP history classes, what if the president, this is Annika, what if the president decides to do it anyway? Yeah. What if he orders yeah. the Defense Department to build the wall even if Congress has vetoed it? Does he, yeah. does he then go through the thing that he did in the Rose Garden? Oh, they'll send it to the courts and the Ninth Circuit will overrule me. And then <laughs> the Supreme Court, hopefully they'll overrule them because I appointed a couple of them, right? I mean, that, that becomes yeah. a true constitutional yeah. crisis. Yeah, exactly. So that's the way it would get to court. If, if the Congress takes, vetoes the action and, and President Trump doesn't honor that veto and, and, and goes ahead with, the, with <laughs> finishing the wall, uh, then it would seem to me it's going to have to go to the Supreme Court and we'll have the biggest decision we've had since U U.S. v. Nixon. Sir. So, uh, you know, I think that we've seen with um, Obama's executive actions that government by executive action can be quickly overturned by the next administration. Yeah. So are we going to see subsequent administrations using executive action to overturn the previous administration and won't that have a very corrosive effect on the U.S. government? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and one, one of the things that scares me now in, in some really major policy areas like immigration policy, civil rights, environmental policy, what we have are dueling administrative swords. And, that's basic, and that, that has been developing in a way since Franklin Roosevelt, but it's really accelerated, as Bill said, with the partisan gridlock we've had since the 19. 1960s and 911, and the way Homeland Security has accentuated executive power, have really, have really em embellished that. And I think I don't see how a, a liberal democracy or a constitutional democracy can survive without the rule of law. But we have really weakened uh, the rule of law in, the, in this country. So we have time for one more question. Oh, no. um, I know, but if you will let Sid exit before you do so, he can get back to. You mean I can't stay for the last question? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not, don't leave now. Don't leave now. I but to once, stay for the last once that's I'm not been going answered, anywhere. <laughs> once that's been answered, you will leave okay. and go sign books. Okay. Um, I will certainly be here, and Bill can stay for a little bit, although he is flying out this afternoon. Yep. So um, we will turn to Professor Bob Strong from Washington yeah. and leave. Come see me outside, please. Yes, Thank you. please do. <laughs> Even if um, you're not going to buy a book. <laughs> I would uh, compliment the panel, and this would also apply to Mike Nelson's book, for talking about the Trump administration in more or less normal terms. <laughs> what are his relations with party, Congress, legislative achievements? How is this administration connected to themes and ideas and American political culture and the rest? Could you take a, at least a few minutes to tell us what's the most abnormal thing <laughs> that's going on? and. Uh, are those kinds of behaviors likely to play a large role in the Trump legacy? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, okay, look, I, to, Bob, yeah. thank you for There's coming. A lot of abnormal and, stuff. And I, it's a terrific question. Yeah. I, the one that worries me the most is acting in defiance, not, of, not just of the Congress, but of any rulings from the courts. Um, and regularly challenging that and brandishing that power is the thing that worries me the most. It's, and, um, you know, he, he hasn't gone so far yet, for instance, for me to say that he should be convicted of impeachment. I think the, the things that he has done with respect to the intelligence agencies, with respect to um, the FBI and the investigation seem to border on certainly obstruction of justice, if not 
underlying crimes. I'm looking forward to seeing the Mueller report. We went the whole hour and a half, I think, without talking about the Mueller report, which could land next week. And that could, how he resp what's in the report and how he responds to it, and how he responds to the rule of law and his role in it, for me, will be the most abnormal thing about, the, the, the thing that I'll look for abnormalcy. And going back to the Mitch McConnell question, I think, frankly, a lot of these Republicans, the, the hardest thing to be right now in Washington is a moderate Republican up for re-election. Because how he responds to these things, they're going to be held accountable in 2020. And within their primary, supporting the president is probably the right thing to do, no matter how abnormal he goes. But then what does that set Susan Collins up for in her re-election battle? Right, that and, you know, as you move from the center out to the right wing of the Republican Party, uh, that calculation becomes trickier and trickier. As the farther right, right you go, it's not so tricky. But as you get in that middle band, how you balance between uh, a hardcore Republican primary where no matter what he says after the Mueller report, it's probably okay when you shift to the general election, depending what the Mueller report says and how the president responds to it, it may not be okay, even for a Mitch McConnell. And I think that that's what I'm really trying to keep my focus on. I, I would just add, Bob, that the, the, most, uh, um, uh, the, the, the most novel thing ab about the Trump presidency, he's the first president to be elected that has no public experience whatsoever. Uh, neither elected experience or experience in the military. Andrew Jackson was not that much of an outsider. He spent time in the Senate, and he also, of course, was a really important military uh, 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 general. Uh, and, and, and I think um, that, that uh, it's not only that he's a, he has a business background, but he was a reality TV star. Uh, and his business is a private business. It's one, not a corporation. And so it, this idea that Bill mentioned before, that I alone can fix it. That, that goes along with a real contempt for in institutions in, in, in American politics is a very dangerous thing. And, and referring to the press as the enemy of the people, that's right out of an, the authoritarian playbook. You know, this, this idea of, of populist authoritarianism, which you, has always had a place in the margins of American politics. Think George Wallace. What the worst case scenario of the Trump presidency is he moves that to the mainstream. Of, of American politics. I think it's unlikely to happen here to invoke a novel that was written during the 1930s, but to, to, it would be naive for us to think it could not happen here. Uh, that's the most abnormal thing, uh, and I think we have to be terribly vigilant about it. Uh, and thank I, you. I, I share Sid's view of that. I mean, the, the, this, by talking about normal versus abnormal, we haven't gotten too offensive. And, on an almost daily basis, I'm offended by something the president does, right? That's the challenge of this job that we have here. Yeah. We want to study the presidency and sort of check our own personal values at the door, but also understand that, roughly speaking, 40% of the American people like what he's doing or approve what he's doing. And understanding that and trying to put it into context, I think, is our day job while regularly being offended. And I, I just feel that way in, in a whole bunch of different ways. Enemy of the American people, press is the enemy of the American people, is probably near the top of my list. But his treatment of women and, um, you know, I, this is something that we've exchanged with, with Mark Short about, where Mark himself said, when the president called um, uh, Stormy Daniels, horse-faced. The President of the United States shouldn't say that to anybody, right? That's just wrong. And um, I certainly feel that way and I'm offended on a regular basis, but the sort of abnormality of it all, I, I'm really thinking about the constitutional yeah. system and what's going to undermine it. And that's, that's where I'm trying to stay focused yeah. as much as possible. You, you know, one of the articles of impeachment against Andrew Johnson was for bad and improper rhetoric. Absolutely, yeah. Because <laughs> Congress was powerful and he attacked the Congress as the enemies of the people in the 1866 election. And, and, and when I tell this to my, you know, when I used to show this to my students, or we, we talk about this, oh, that's ridiculous. You can't impeach a president for, for what he says. Well, I'll tell you, since the Trump presidency, for better or worse, they're newly, they're, they're newly interested in this, in this article of impeachment against. <laughs> against Can I stick with that? Because for... rhetoric is not just rhetoric. These are not just words. President, the, the bully pulpit, as Theodore Roosevelt put it, has a powerful effect on the moral dimensions of American politics. And if I can stick with the Johnson thing, which I think is a fascinating parallel, the Senate had the votes to convict Johnson. Yeah. They yeah. decided not to because they didn't want his vice president, 
Um, or they didn't want, they didn't, ha they didn't have a vice president because yeah, they didn't have the succession. Yeah, sent the Senate uh, pro tem. The Senate pro tem to become president. Benjamin Wade, I can't what, believe I remember Exactly. That. Yeah. What they really <laughs> wanted, what the Republicans that controlled pro Congress really wanted was Ulysses Grant to become president. But they wanted to weaken the president. So they went through the whole process of impeachment as a way to uh, impeaching him in the House, trying him in the Senate, but holding off one vote short. And they could have changed votes back and forth to go over the top and convict him, and they held off because they didn't want to convict him. They just wanted to weaken him so badly that they could elect yeah. their own Republican president the next yeah. time around. And so, like, you know, as we enter a period where impeachment is quite possible, and as one former Republican who's now no longer Republican, Pete Weiner, recently wrote, um, impeachment seems impossible until it seems inevitable. We just don't know what the next few months are going to hold. It could Conviction could be an impossibility. It, it might so suddenly become inevitable that we're talking about a President, Trump, uh, a President Pence uh, in a few yeah. short months. Maybe that's why Mark went back to government. <laughs> <laughs> the shortest, smarter guy we think, huh? No well, comment. Well, <laughs> Maybe he knows more than we do. Before we thank our wonderful panelists, I, I want to have you give a round of applause to uh, Christina lopez Gatardi chow to Bunny Shepard, and to Alfred yes. Reed. Without yeah. them, we wouldn't have these wonderful events. So. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. I, I want to thank you too, Barbara, for oh, being such a great thank, moderator. Oh, thank you, Sid. Um, but can you believe how lucky I am to be here at the Miller Center and have these gentlemen as my colleagues and friends? So thank you, and let's thank them. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Go sign books. Thank you. Go sign books. Thank you, Doug.